Um, so we are going to get into uh, what we call Aristotelian argument, um, which is a philosophical kind of argument. And we're going to understand something about the philosophy of argumentation today. Um, so I do want to start by saying that there are a lot of different types of argument. At some point, I'm going to uh, suggest that you stop this video uh, and watch Tolman uh, or that you watch the Tolman argument, the academic side of argument, um, when, we're, when we're finished with this presentation, because these two things do go hand in hand. And we want to borrow a lot of different types of argumentation styles when we're doing a project like Diso Logoi even though at the end of the day, Diso Logoi is a distinctly academic argument and an academic exercise. So let's go ahead and talk about argument in general before I get to any of these slides and suggest that there are different kinds of arguments, right? Um, for one, there's the argument where you need to win. Uh, it's very important that you win and uh, strategy or uh, you know, evidence or whatever, whatever things that you can compile in the heat of the moment um, is going to win the day. So uh, there's a time limit on this kind of argument, um, and it's the type of argument that I'm going to say, say it's the get it, go out, <laughs> it's the take out your trash argument, okay? So this is the one that you might get in, into a fight with your parents. You are preoccupied with something. Your duty is to take out the trash. You have not done so. Uh, and they're, they're on your case about it, right? So your arguments might be, they're, they're not going to be well thought out. They're not going to be planned. Um, they're going to be very emotional and very inside of the moment. Uh, I don't want to do this right now. Can I, you know, it used to be, can I wait for a commercial? It might be, can I, can I finish this YouTube video? Um, or I'm in the middle of a lesson, you know, whatever thing that it is that's preoccupying you that you don't want to take out the trash, uh, that's going to become your argument, right? And it's, it's usually going to be, like I said, emotional. And your parents uh, are going to have uh, maybe a slightly higher ground that it is your responsibility to take out the trash, and maybe you've had time to do it, and, and you've left it up to the last minute. Who knows what the circumstance is? Um, but you know it's your responsibility and you haven't done it. So they might have the high ground on this argument, but it doesn't mean that they won't just be as emotional as you are. Uh, I mean, hopefully not, because they're adults and you're teenagers and they should be slightly less emotional than you are. Um, but, you know, who knows? Maybe mom's had a really bad day and she's asked you a half dozen times and it's still not done. And so oh, the emotions are there, right? Um, everybody has an agenda. Each person's agenda is, I don't want to take out the trash. It is your responsibility to take out the trash. And at the end of the day, somebody has to take it out, right? So um, that's, that's not the type of argument that we are going to engage in in this class. And I would suggest that even though this is the most common type of argument that we have, if we learn something about academic argument and philosophical argument, then we're going to stop engaging and petty arguments, not all together because that's not possible, but we're going we're gonna to start becoming more rational beings and saying like, okay, it, it actually is my responsibility and I should have done it before and just because it's inconvenient for me now doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, or mom comes home and it's not done and it's like, well, it's going to take me 20 seconds instead of yelling at my kid for, you know, 20 minutes. Uh, and I just don't want to get into it, so I'm going to surrender and not argue the first time, right? So that's a, that's a whole field. Yeah, I haven't even gotten any slides yet. I'm already taking up too much of your time. So let's, let's backtrack. Let's go all the way back to, man, almost the beginning of recorded Western history and talk about Aristotle. So Aristotle, uh, he comes up with what he calls Aristotelian argument. Go figure, he named it after himself. And what he's going to say uh, is that we should use ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, so one of the things to really understand about Aristotelian argument is it's not so much about beating your opponent. It's more about getting your opponent and the audience engaged inside of the debate. And overall, it's going to be more how the people feel than how somebody else feels. So um, in an ideal world, a presidential debate would be an Aristotelian argument where we don't expect the two candidates to really agree on um, taxes, for example, and who should be taxed and who shouldn't. 
they're probably never going to agree on that, but it's up to them to persuade us as the audience that I align more closely to your view of taxes and that is one reason that I am going to vote for you. Don't ever be a one issue voter, by the way. The world's too complicated for that. So ethos, what is ethos? Just a reminder, ethos is an appeal to credibility. So what's credible? Well, it's gonna be in the eyes of the audience, right? Depending on what is credible and what is not. Um, and so let's go through some things that are credible. Well, typically God and religion is seen as a credible force, right? That if I make my appeal that, um, you know, that in the eyes of God, uh, this country will be rejuvenated if you vote for me, then uh, I'm making an ethical argument, right? Um, I am going to use the concept of gun control as our, as our general kind of platform to talk about argumentation. So if I am anti-gun control, if I'm pro-gun rights, I might say it is, it's in the Constitution, right, that I get to own a gun. That's, it's my constitutional right, and it's in the Bill of Rights. It's my Second Amendment. Um, and so you hear that argument really often, right, that the founders, uh, we kind of put the founders in a very special place because everything that they did was right, Right? Right? Um, and so we typically do say, hey, they came up with this idea. We built our country around it, so I get to continue using this thing. Um, and that's an idea of credibility. Another good example of credibility is just what is right. So we usually try to appeal to what is the right thing to do, or what is the rational thing to do, or what is the human thing to do. All of these are appeals to hopefully a higher credibility. And so if I'm, you know, if I'm voting for a presidential candidate and they are appealing to these bigger than life concepts that I agree with, then I'm probably going to be swayed to vote for, to vote for them, right? Swayed to vote for them. Um, and that's where the ethical argument comes in. Pathos, right, is one that we should really, really uh, know. Pathos is all about emotions. Uh, and I think we've seen a lot of that in American politics very recently, where it's not really about what's right or wrong. It's not really about um, holding up any kind of ideal. It's more, I feel offended, and therefore I get to attack people for offending me, right? And that it's all my emotional state. And so, uh, again, if you can rally people around that emotional state and whip them up, then they're going to support you, right? Um, taking it down to something like gun rights, um, the, the students and teachers at Parkland are using a, a, patho, a pathos argument, almost a pathological argument, although don't think they're not dissimilar, um, right? I was put in jeopardy, my life was on the line, and you're telling me that that was okay just because you want to own a firearm, right? That's a pathological argument or a pathos argument. Huh. I'm gonna do that a couple more times, I swear. On the other side, right, imagine um, you know, a girl who created a really positive bond with her father because he took her hunting and taught her how to use that weapon properly and how to clean it and how to make sure that um, it was always in, in safe use. Um, and that person's gonna grow up with an emotional attachment to how important it is for us to bear arms. Um, and so you can, you can tell when you have two groups that are only arguing through pathos, they're probably not going to see eye to eye. They're too far apart. And uh, pathos, therefore, is very, very powerful, very, very dangerous to use as a strategy. But we, I think it's the strategy that we see used by far the most often. Um, and, and definitely we could see that in any argument that we put up to the table. Now, logos is going to be based on evidence and data and information, right? Um, and I'm going to talk about this a lot when we talk about Tolman and uh, academic argument. Um, and here we have uh, some, some really powerful examples of logic um, forcing us or, or, or winning us over as audience members to say yes, um, I want to vote for the person who I think is most likely or, or whose plan is most likely 
to defeat the coronavirus by such and such a date, right? That's a, that's a logical way. Like if, I, if it comes down to it, then I am gonna be a one issue voter and it's gonna be that issue. Um, that's how, I mean, that's a deception of logic, but we can see how people get there. Or um, I'm, I'm looking at concrete evidence. The other side doesn't wanna look at that evidence. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna reject a lot of what they say. Uh, so um, I can't think of a good one with guns without getting too uh, inflammatory. So I'll just say something like climate change, where you, if you don't believe in climate change, you're just kind of actively saying, I'm not gonna follow any of the evidence or the logic or the observable information. I'm gonna walk outside and say, it's February, it's cold. That's good enough for me. Climate change doesn't really exist or global warming doesn't exist because Texas got hit by a, by a snowstorm. Uh, that's, that's intentionally misrepresenting logic and we're gonna get into a whole thing about logical fallacies and how we can intentionally disrupt that logic apple cart. Uh, so Aristotle, he says, ethos, pathos, and logos, they work because we are rational animals. Human beings are rational animals. And when it comes down to it, we are not going to bow down to credibility. We're not going to bow down to uh, pathos. We are logical. We're going to use ration and reason to overcome those baser parts of our nature. Uh, and I don't know who needed to tell him this, but he was totally wrong, right? Uh, we certainly at some times do not seem like we are rational animals. Um, and so that's a big flaw. He's building his entire premise on uh, the most logical people will always went out. And he's, he's been wrong about that uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, so that's a, something to kind of think about when we think about the Aristotelian model. Again, the big part of the Aristotelian model is we're using strategies to manipulate our audience, right? Now, Aristotle is going to say logos isn't really a strategy. That's the straight up good stuff. And that's the, the real real, as the kids would say. Um, but that's, uh, that's only one tool in your toolbox when you're trying to manipulate that audience. And ultimately, you have to manipulate audiences for any real change to happen. So again, I'm not going to hold a forum uh, to determine whether or not I should take out the garbage. Um, Aristotle is going to say, no, that, that one's not about changing the mind of your audience. And, and by the way, you're probably not going to change your mom's mind either, even if she's the singular audience for that argument. So uh, here's a point if you, uh, I'm going to let you choose your own adventure. You can choose to um, stop and listen to the Tolman uh, piece as we, as we put these types of things together um, and just listen about academic argument, or you can choose to, to kind of move on. We're going to talk about some other people here. So Carl Rogers, he's going to come up with this thing called Rogerian argument. He is... Um, He's a therapist and a writer, and he's going to say that um, when we start to formulate beliefs, they become part of our identity. Um, and so one of the reasons that the uh, pro-gun group and the pro-gun control group aren't going to get along is because our experiences have really helped us to identify what we think is important about both of those issues. Uh, that example of the girl who made that strong bond with her dad and the example of the Parkland kids, um, those are examples of people who have been fundamentally changed by that belief system. And so if they are um, arguing with each other, you're just going to have what we call a resistant opponent. We're not really going to get anything done. So unlike Tolman, who's going to take the concept of Aristotle and filter it through reasoned, rationalized thinking. And we're, we're going to talk about things almost in a philosophical way. Should there be gun control? Should there not be gun control? Well, it's just an argument that's going to go on forever. Rogers is going to say, we need to get beyond that. Um, and so here's a hopefully funny example of uh, an entrenched thinker.
that sonata may not be a Glenn Gould performance, but I must say it's good as Gould. <laughs> hey, Flanders, heading for church? Well, I thought I could save you a little time. Ooh, found a new shortcut. Better. I was working on a flat tax proposal, and I accidentally proved there's no God. We'll just see about that. Uh-oh. Well, maybe he made a mistake. Nope. It's airtight. Can't let this little doozy get out. Yeah. So, um, you know, hopefully that's a little funny. Um, the idea there is that Flanders is an entrenched thinker, and that if Homer really wanted to compete with him about this, this uh, question, then neither of them is really going to get anywhere because evidence is not going to convince uh, Ned of anything. Um, so how do we get beyond this concept? Uh, how, do, how do we solve anything if we have uh, all these entrenched thinkers running around? Well, uh, for one, we got to get rid of some of these things that uh, don't matter so much. So we got to get rid of some of the uh, credibility stuff. We have to strip ourselves of the emotional stuff. And uh, ultimately, we have to come with the perspective of, well, what needs to change or what really needs to be confronted? And then how can we find a common ground to get us to understand each other? Carl Rogers is essentially going to say, we're all idiots. Uh, and <laughs> that if we just keep this up, then we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, and we have to kind of elevate ourselves to, to get somewhere. So what he's going to say is, okay, pro-gun control people, anti-gun control people, look, don't argue pro and anti-gun control. What's the real problem? Well, the real problem is that we have too many mass shootings in the United States. And uh, you know what? Pro-gun people, you're going to have to get rid of some of that animus, that, uh, that anger, and that, that uh, credibility of what's well, in the Constitution. I get to own it to acknowledge that this is a problem. And anti-gun people, you're going to have to make some, some contrition here as well. Uh, it's not realistic to get rid of every gun in America. It's just not going to happen. So how do we start to solve some of these problems by looking at, well, what do we both want out of this? Well, we both want fewer gun deaths. I think everybody wants that, except for the murderers who are using the guns to kill people. So uh, that's where we should start our discussion. And it should be a discussion. And it should be about finding common ground to get to some of these things. So um, this is not something that we're going to use directly in Diso Logoi, uh, because Diso Logoi is more about understanding the two complex sides of, of an argument. Um, but to me, it's the next rational step for where we should move if we actually want to solve problems. And if you really understand both sides of the argument, at least on an academic plane, then I think you can start to come up with some places that are middle grounds. And I will add to this, you can't do it alone. It's the really important part of Rogers coming in here. He's going to say, we can't do it by just winning over a good chunk of the audience. We can't do it by winning over 51%, right? That's never going to work. Instead, we need to find common ground places for these debates to happen, and we need to be willing to let go of some stuff. Um, and I started teaching this a few years ago, and it just seems more and more pressing all of the time. It seems like we are definitely deadlocked at almost every single issue, and uh, look at what's happening. We're, we're not getting any better as a society because of that gridlock. So Rogers is going to uh, ben, uh, push for mutual understanding and benefit. Mutual becomes really the big thing. We're not interested in finger pointing. We're interested in problem solving. Um, and that means that we have to have mutual control as opposed to, again, persuading other people that this is the way to do it. Oh, sorry. Um, Rogers also talks about this when writing. So instead of a writer dictating one point of view and replacing a reader's image with that new point of view, 
uh, then the goal is to facilitate that point of view and make that uh, a mutual place for communication and cooperation with the audience. So again, something that I don't think we see very often, we typically see uh, you know, in our research, things that are going to argue this is the only way to do it or this is the best way to do it or something along those lines as opposed to asking our audience to be a part of the process, which is, of course, much, much harder. Um, we did get a couple of Rogerian rhetoric rules from this. A few of his students, Becker, uh, Young, Becker, and Pike, came up with introduce the problem and the understanding of the audience's position. So the first thing you really have to do is understand who your audience is. So again, this is the opposite of the presidential debate model um, where it says, well, I know who some of my audience, I know, I know that my, my biggest audience are people who are undecided. Uh, that's who my biggest audience is, but I don't really know why they're undecided. Um, and, and sometimes maybe we'll take a shot or two at trying to understand that audience, but we're really not understanding something key here. Um, instead, we're going to, um, as, as you may have heard, just appeal to our base, appeal to the people who already agree with us and hope that that number outnumbers the people who don't agree with us. And I think we can see, like if you just keep telling people who already agree with you that they're right and stroking their ego all the time, then they're gonna become even more resistant thinkers. Um, the second idea here is that the statement of context in which the audience's position may be valid. So, uh, hey, I might disagree with you on a bunch of stuff, but if I don't tell you, yes, I think that's valid when it is, then um, we're just going to create more resistant relationships. And I, I could tell you, um, like one of my closest friends, he's on the not the opposite side of the political spectrum than I am, but, but close enough. Um, and he, to, to his real credit, I think I get a little too tired of it uh, every once in a while, but to his credit, he always wants to argue with me on stuff because he knows I'm going to bring the heat and that I'm going to bring the understanding, but I'm also not going to shame him for stuff that he doesn't know. And that's become a really valuable part of our friendship and I, I just sometimes have to say, I am just not in the mood to argue. I can't bring all of it. I'm not, I'm not at my 100% uh, to stop those, those arguments. But that's become something that's really important. And uh, we do have to, I think, consistently, and I'm sure I, I just started it because I, I you know, started to learn all this stuff. Uh, but I had to start saying, like, yeah, you are right about that. I, I don't have a good opposition. Or uh, let me look that up. I, I feel like that's not right, but I don't have anything right now that, that uh, disproves it. You, you got me there. Uh, you know, that be, that's become an important part of our ongoing argument in our, in our friendship. So the, the big takeaway that I hope that you're getting from this is that there are just a ton of different ways to argue um, and it really depends on what do you want to get out of the argument and if one of the things that you want to get out of the argument is winning then you're probably not going to be successful if you want to solve a problem well, we got to get more people involved but certainly solving a problem is going to have to start with understanding our opposition in some way and stop treating them like direct opposition um, and then I should put, there's, there are caveats to that, right? As much as I want to understand the, the opposition of a lot of the kind of thinking that I have, I'm definitely not going to embrace racism as a part of that. That's a no-hold barred. It's a non-starter. I'm not going to uh, appreciate sexism as a part of that. Uh, so there are some things. There are some things that we have to kind of hold the ground on if we do want to move forward in progress. But again, moving to something like gun control, my hope is that we don't get to those places. And if we get to those places, maybe I can find more people who agree with me that the racism is the problem than the gun is the problem or something along those lines. I think those are the conversations that we ultimately uh, want to get to the root of. 